Hello and welcome. My name is Ted Bradley, a hypnotist uh, specializing in quit smoking. In fact, uh, quitting smoking is all I do. Here's what uh, we're going to do today. We're going to talk about habit and addiction and the smoker's mind. There's been a lot of questions popping up uh, on my Facebook feeds about um, what's the difference between a habit and an addiction and how, how does it work in a smoker's mind and how does a smoker deal with it. So one of the things you're going to get if you stay to the end of this video, which it will be a rather short video, is I'm going to give you some real life practical things you can do, one in particular, to um, deal with anytime you have a craving. Cravings are one of the most uh, missed, uh, understood things in regards to smoking and how it works, why it works, and how to deal with it. It's something that all people who try quit smoking, they know intuitively because most people who try quit smoking will have a craving. Okay, so we're just going to wait uh, a minute or two, just uh, let a few more people jump on. And um, uh, during this video at any time, uh, please just type in a question. Uh, if you're watching this after and it's not live, uh, in the comments, I always go over all the comments on all of my Facebook Live videos. Just write in a question. You can always uh, reach out to me. Uh, wherever you are in your quit smoking journey, uh, at any time, you can just go to my website. You can either join my program or if you're doing it on your own, cold turkey. Tons of information there. The reason why I do this is I lost both of my grandmothers to smoking. And so I've dedicated my life to helping people like you quit smoking forever. So whether or not you use my program, another program, or, or use all this free content where I do everything I can to give you all the tools you need so you don't even necessarily need to use my program to help you quit smoking, then I've done uh, my job and I I've feel I've have provided service uh, back to the world. Um, okay, so let's start. Um, first of all, when we talk about smoking and addiction versus habit, is it sm is smoke is smoking an addiction? Is smoking a habit? And how does that and why does that cause cravings? The very first thing we have to understand is, like most things in life, it's a little bit from column A, a little bit from column B. So we need to just define what do we mean by these terms: craving, addiction, and habit, and what's the differences. And then once we understand that, when you get to the end of this talk, I will give you a killer trick you can do to deal with any cravings you get from smoking. Okay, so let's talk about cravings. Craving, quite simply, it's a powerful desire for something. So sometimes people uh, understand this as uh, a craving for chocolate. Uh, some people will often describe it to me as a longing, a yearning, a hankering, a hunger, a thirst. A craving is, uh, especially when you're quitting smoking and you are going through that process of expelling the nicotine from your body, um, you know, it's like they often describe it, it's a pull, right, to have a cigarette. So a craving is just simply, it's just a powerful desire for something, okay? In, in our case, it's cigarettes or cigarette smoking or nicotine, okay? That's what a craving is. So people often associate cravings with either addiction or habit, okay? Well, we have to understand what's the difference between an addiction and a habit, and in particular, what does that mean for a smoker and how does that work with smoking? Okay, so addiction is a very complex subject. Um, people spend their life studying addiction, okay? The best definition of addiction, quite frankly, is right out of Wikipedia. <clears throat> addiction is a brain disorder characterized by compulsive engagement in rewarding stimuli despite adverse consequences, okay? So basically all that means is we have, um, behavioral scientists like to define addiction as we know something's bad for us, but we, we chemically, our brain needs it need, and creates a desire for us to do it. So we do it in the face of we know it's not good for us. Sound like smoking? <laughs> okay. So that's essentially what an addiction is. An addiction is really a technical term to describe a physiological state. The physiological of your state being addicted to something. 
in particular your brain and for your your brain to be addicted to it the chemical needs to actually be in your brain okay so when you smoke cigarettes or you vape or you take any nicotine product even when you're doing the patch or any nicotine replacement you are still physically addicted okay i want to say that again if you're taking the patch the gum any what we call nicotine replacement therapy you're still in addiction because the chemical is still present in your brain. The theory on uh, nicotine replacement is that basically uh, the patch and these things, you're supposed to take less and less of the addictive substance so that that withdrawal isn't as severe if you just quit cold turkey. That's the whole point of these programs. Okay, and if you look at the efficacy, which is really just a scientific way of saying um, – uh, measured success rate, okay? And there's lots of efficacy studies on these. They're in the teens. So whether it's the patch, the gum, Chantex, I believe is 22. Uh, you can Google it. It might be 23. I don't remember exactly. But they're in, they're in the teens. And if that works and you manage to quit smoking on it, that's awesome. Good for you, okay? Um, but the important part to understand about addiction is that if the chemical is in your brain, you are technically addicted because you're doing something you know is bad for you, but you can't stop yourself doing it because your brain requires that nicotine stimulant as a reward. Okay, that's what an addiction is. An addiction is a chemical addiction typically in your brain where you want a rewarding stimuli, even though you're consciously aware that it has adverse consequences. That's addiction. Okay, that's not a habit. A habit is very different. So what is a habit? Okay, so a habit, it's it's a settled or regular tendency or practice. Uh, so it's something we do all the time. Okay, so uh, it's just something that we do regular. It's not, uh, it's not a chemical process in the brain. And when I say it's not a chemical process in, in the brain, let me explain what I mean by it's not a chemical process in the brain. Everything we do is a chemical process in the brain. What I mean by habit is it doesn't run the same process chemically in your brain, okay, that addiction does. And the, the addiction stimulates a different part of your brain that has to do with reward, okay? That's not what habit does, okay? So, Habit is very different. It's a, a learned behavior that you repeat, okay? So now we know what a craving is, okay? A craving is just simply a powerful desire for something. And an addiction is a, it's a brain disorder, disorder characterized by compulsive engagement in rewarding stimuli despite adverse consequences, okay? We know that a habit is something you do on a regular basis, Okay, and those are those are the difference between those definitions. But now that we understand those definitions, we need to understand how does that work in the smoker's brain. Okay, so to do that, to understand how these different things, how they they interplay, because in life things are usually a dance, and it's not just you're addicted or it's a habit. It, it's a, it's both. Okay, so we need to understand that. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you what we call a mind map. Okay, so a mind map is just a way of basically looking at the mind, okay? So all that means is there's different ways that uh, in neuroscience we um, chop up the brain. And when, we say, when I say chop up the brain, I mean how we understand it. And so uh, we call them mind maps because they have explanatory power. So uh, we, for smoking, we just need a very simple mind map, okay? So I'll draw it for you really quickly so you can see, see the one that – best describes uh, cravings, habit, uh, and addiction on the human brain, okay? So I'll draw this for you on a piece of paper, so it's very simple. Okay, hopefully you can see this. So essentially this circle here, okay, that's your brain. And that line here, you see right here, okay, that's the... This down here, this area in the mind map, is your unconscious mind. The area above, right here, is your conscious mind. Okay. So when we say, when I say conscious mind and unconscious mind, you only have one mind. You don't actually have 
pieces of your different pieces of your mind and you'll notice I don't say subconscious mind the reason I don't say subconscious mind is there's actually no scientific evidence that a subconscious mind exists okay we in neuroscience we believe it exists but I, we can't do a, a, a scan of your brain and point at it and go there's your subconscious mind what we can do is we can measure our minds and we can see the neurological activity. So we know where conscious thoughts are and we know where unconscious thoughts are. Okay. So that's what I mean in this mind map here. This bottom part of the circle here is your un your unconscious thoughts. That's where your unconscious thoughts happen in your mind. This top part is your conscious thoughts, where we know we have conscious thoughts. And then this little square here up in your conscious mind, that's your thinking thing. Your your internal dialogue is what they call it in neuroscience. Okay. So, uh, parts, these parts of our mind, they have different functions and they do different things. Okay. And what we know in neuroscience is that they don't do the same thing. They do very different things. And it's really important to understand the differences. So our conscious mind in the mind map, this part right here. Okay. Is basic, uh, number one, job so they call these things executive functions it means what does it actually do what is the neurological activity in our conscious mind doing okay what our conscious mind actually does is it's where our willpower is our ability to make a decision am i going to turn left am i going to turn right uh sam harris and other philosophers often disagree on what free will is but we do know from neuroscience that we do have willpower and the ability to decide and we know that that happens in our conscious mind okay so the first thing is in our conscious mind is it can make decisions the second thing that our conscious mind does is our conscious mind it's a interpreter it brings in our internal senses so everything we hear we see we touch we smell that all happens in our conscious mind it's an interpreter and it goes through our conscious mind and into our unconscious mind okay so those are the two main fun executive functions of the conscious mind now the conscious mind does other things but the important thing to know in terms of smoking is the conscious mind can only do kind of three to five things at one time and then it gets confused and it can't do anymore. So the, the conscious mind is really designed for interpreting, bringing in senses and making decisions, okay? And it can only do three to five things at one time, okay? So I'll give you an example of that. Uh, if you had to walk consciously, okay, your conscious mind would go, okay, right foot forward, then left foot forward, okay, and oh, you kind of lose your center of gravity, so you have to bring your center of gravity forward. So you're trying to walk using your conscious thoughts. That's three things. You can kind of do that. But throw in moving your arms. Now you're going to swing your arms. Now your conscious mind has to go, okay, I can put my right, le my right foot forward. Then I'm going to bring my, should I bring my right hand forward or my left arm forward? What would be more efficient? Okay. It very easily gets overwhelmed, our conscious mind. You can only do three to five things. When you're standing, close your eyes. And you'll notice that you sway. The reason why you sway is in order to have balance, your, your mind has to fire neurons and fire little tiny micro muscles to keep you balanced. If you had to stand using your conscious mind, you just fall over, okay? That's not the purpose of the conscious mind. The conscious mind is not to run the system. It's to interpret the outside world for our unconscious mind, okay? That is what the conscious mind does, okay? I, and I'm gonna bring this back to smoking so you can understand habit and addiction and things like that in a few minutes. The unconscious mind. The unconscious mind's job is memory, okay? There are no memories in our conscious mind. You have to, if, you, if I ask you a question like, think of your grade 12 math teacher, you would pause and you'd have to think. The reason why you pause is your conscious mind has no memory. It has to go back into your unconscious mind, find the memory, and then bring it to your conscious mind. Bring it forward, okay? And then it kind of bubbles up and pops in. You go, oh, yeah, Mr. Gregory, okay? So memory is what your unconscious mind does. It's your memory, okay? It's your imagination, your fantasy. Um, 
um, it's a basically a supercomputer. It can do a million things at one time. Okay, so we've essentially evolved to have a super powerful unconscious mind and a weak conscious mind. Okay, so here's what happens. Okay, I'll give you an example so that you can a real practical example you can understand. And don't forget at the end, I'm going to give you a tip, something you can do practically so that you can kick any craving. Okay, but before I give that to you, it's really important to understand how addiction and cravings work in the smoker's mind. Okay, so here's an example. Okay, um, you step out in front of a bus. Okay, uh, if your conscious mind had to deal with that and the bus is barreling down on you, it's going to hit you. If your conscious mind had to do it, your conscious mind would go, oh, remember, it has your willpower. It makes decisions. It contemplates. Do I go left? Do I go right? Do I jump back? Do I duck? Do I roll? Okay. You just get hit by the bus. Okay. We've evolved so that in cases of fear, okay, danger, self-preservation, our unconscious mind comes forward. It shuts our conscious mind down. It doesn't really shut it down. It basically puts it in park from a neuroscience point of view, puts it in park and your unconscious mind just takes over. It's the exact same thing as if I had a ball, okay, and I threw a ball at your face. If your conscious mind had to deal with it, it would go, oh, do, I got to avoid this ball. It's going to hit me. It might hurt. Do I go this way? Do I go that way? Do I duck? Boom. You just get hit with the ball in the face, okay? So because it's shock, fear, self-preservation, whatever, our unconscious mind, which is a supercomputer, shuts down, parks the conscious mind, and you just react, okay? That's the job of the unconscious mind. The unconscious mind's job is your memory. It's your emotions. It's um, your imagination, your fantasy. That all happens in the unconscious mind. It does not happen in the conscious mind. Okay, so let's talk about addiction. Addiction is... Um, essentially a chemical response in the brain, okay, to uh, an addictive chemical. So in smoking, that's basically nicotine. So what happens when we smoke, our brain becomes dependent upon the, the nicotine. When I say dependent, what I, mean, what I mean is the nicotine stimulates the reward center in the brain. So the brain wants it, okay? And as long as the nicotine is in our system, the brain will want it, okay? So when when we ingest nicotine, okay, the nicotine stays in our system for three days. That's it. Three days. After three days, there is no chemical addiction in your body. It's impossible. It defies the laws of physics after three days for you to be addicted to nicotine. It's gone. Okay, so you can have echoes, but we'll talk about echoes in a minute. But I just mean physiologically, neuro, from a neuroscientific point of view, there's no addiction anymore. Okay, now anyone who's quit knows that they go past three days and they get cravings and things like this. Okay, I've helped so many people quit smoking over the years. I'm going to give you a, a really good example of how this phenomena shows up of the three days of nicotine in your system. In the first three days when somebody leaves my office, okay, or I do a Skype session with them, okay? And they leave, and, and within three days, if they call me back and they say, within three days, I'm having a craving. And I say to them, you're having a craving, uh, point to it, show me, point to where the craving is in your body. All the time, they'll either point to their lungs, okay? Sometimes they'll point to their stomach and occasionally they'll point to their mouth, okay? Within three days, you can have a real physiological craving. Okay. After three days, if it's been more than 72 hours, now that's an average. After 72 hours, somebody calls me on the phone and says, ah, I'm on day five and I'm having a craving. And I say to them, point, where is it in your body? 100% of the time, you know where all people point? Every time. Because it's a thought. They have a thought that they're having a craving. They're experiencing something physiologically a pull or a desire and they have a thought or an association that it's a craving. Okay. It's not addiction at this point. It's a habit. So let's talk about habit. And okay, most people who smoke, uh, start before the age of 27. It's very hard to find somebody who starts smoking after the age of 27. When people start smoking after the age of 27, typically they smoked when they were 16 to 18 or they had smoked at some point. Okay. But 
98% of the time, here's how somebody describes uh, being a, a smoker to me, okay? So they come into my office, they've smoked for uh, 20 years, okay? And they say, oh, I started when I was 16. I say, why? Why doesn't really matter because there's really a, a one common reason why most people start smoking. But they'll describe it as uh, everyone in my family did. Uh, my friends did. Uh, I wanted to rebel. Um, uh, I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be cool. Uh, there's lots of reasons, but basically if I distill them all down, it's basically smoke, feel good, right? Whether it's to rebel, to fit in, to be cool, smoke, feel good. And here, here you are, you're 16, okay? And most people at 16, they're only smoking five to 10 cigarettes a day because they don't have the access or the money usually, but they kind of hit 17, 18, 19. And fairly quick order, they're up to half a pack to a pack a day. Okay, so here you are, you're 19, 20, you're smoking a pack a day. Okay, that's 20 cigarettes. And most people, when they take a cigarette and they take a drag, like this, they usually take about 15 to 20 drags on a cigarette. Some people take 10. Mostly it's because they take, uh, it's not, it's because they're slow smokers. Some people just are slow smokers. Some people are really fast and they'll take like 30, but on average, it's kind of like 20 drags. So here you are 20 times a day taking 20 drags. That's 400 times a day. You're taking your cigarette and you're going to your mouth. Smoke, feel good, smoke, feel good, smoke, feel good, smoke, feel good. Now remember the unconscious mind is where habit exists. So anything we do on a regular basis, like walking, breathing, things we do all the time. Okay. That's all inside the unconscious mind. Right? So here you are 20 times a day. 400 times a day, you're going smoke, feel good, 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 smoke, feel good. Okay. And you're, you're 16, 17, 18, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you're 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. Okay. So 400 times a day, seven days a week, you're going smoke, feel good, 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 endlessly, endlessly. Okay. For a decade, some people do it longer than a decade. Well, here's the thing about this mind map and why I showed this to you. You'll notice I have this line right here, okay? That, that line separates the conscious mind from the unconscious mind, okay? That's called the critical faculty. In neuroscience, the critical faculty's job is to basically protect what's in the unconscious mind. Okay. Remember the conscious mind is an interpreter brings in the senses. It goes through the critical faculty. The critical faculty's job is to protect the unconscious mind, your memories, your emotions, your feelings. But here's the thing about that, that thing that separates it. Okay. When we're young, it's really porous. Everything gets through. But later in life at age 27, it basically locks down like a safe and we want it to lock down like a safe later in life, but we want it to be porous early in life. And here's why learning. Okay. A seven year old can learn four languages fluently. Okay. I'm 50. I couldn't learn a new language fluently for the next 50 years. Okay. The reason why a seven year old can learn four languages is they have a critical faculty that's full of holes and it's like Swiss cheese. Everything gets through. It just gets through and it Im implants in the unconscious mind, in our memory. Okay. That's why kids learn so well. That's why as a species, we have dedicated uh, the younger years of life to learning. Okay. That's why, because that's the prime time. Everything gets in, everything gets in, everything gets in. But uh, emotion resides in our unconscious mind. And so this critical faculty regulates, that's its job. So it regulates. So it helps us regulate emotion. That's why your five-year-old can sit in your lap. Oh, I love you. 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 Can I have a cookie? You say no. And they freak out and they're angry and they hate you and they're crying and they're emotional. And then two minutes later, they love you again. Their critical faculty is not developed well enough. And so that critical faculty is what regulates emotion. Okay. That's its job. If we didn't develop a stronger critical faculty, we wouldn't be able to regulate emotion later in life. So what would happen? You're 30 and you walk into a Starbucks, you go to order a coffee. Okay. The barista behind the counter loves you the minute you walk in. Don't, they don't like how you order your coffee. Then they hate you. Then they're mad at you. They're angry. Then they're crying. By the time you get to the end to pick up your coffee, they're in love with you again, okay? 
we couldn't function as a society. So our critical faculty develops so we can regulate emotion. Essentially, it closes down over time. So here you are, you're a smoker, you're 16. Guess what? You don't have a developed critical faculty. Everything's getting in. Smoke, feel good, smoke, feel good, smoke, feel good. 400 times a day, day. 400 times a day, you're going smoke, feel good, 16. You don't have a fully developed critical faculty. You hit 27, your critical faculty shuts down, walls off the unconscious mind. Guess what's in your unconscious mind? Smoke, feel good. You hypnotized yourself, okay? You gave yourself a habit. What else do you do 400 times a day for a decade with an underdeveloped critical faculty? Walk, breathing, right? So smoking is an addiction. There is no doubt. Nicotine is an addictive substance. But after 72 hours, when the smoking is, the nicotine is gone for your system, there is no addiction. You are not addicted. You have a super powerful habit. So here's what happens. You go and you watch your mother die of emphysema in a hospital, okay, from smoking. You know smoking can kill you. You can get in the elevator. You can go down two floors. You can walk out the front door of the hospital and you can think to yourself, I don't want to smoke. It's, it's no good for me. Your unconscious mind, where you have given yourself the habit of smoke, feel good, smoke, feel good, smoke, feel good, smoke, feel good, okay, it's walled off by your critical faculty. It thinks to itself, hey, I got to have, uh, I got to feel good. I just, I just watched my mother die of emphysema. I got to feel good. It thinks smoke, feel good. Your conscious mind says, smoke, it could kill me. I just watched my mother die. Your unconscious mind, which is a supercomputer, can overpower your conscious mind at any time says, sorry, smoke, feel good. And guess what you do? You light up. It's not that you're addicted. It's that you have a super powerful unconscious mind that thinks smoke, feel good. Okay. That's what happens. So when the question is about habit and addiction and smoking, what is it? The truth is, it's like most things in life. Two things can be true at the same time. It's absolutely an addiction. The science is in. Okay. What I'm telling you is after 72 hours, it's not the addiction anymore that has you trapped. It's the habit that, that you have, you hypnotize yourself in your unconscious mind. That's where the habit part kicks in. That's why people quit smoking. They go past the 72 hours and they still have what they call cravings. Okay. So uh, let's talk about cravings because we're almost at the 30 minute mark here. And I'm going to post this on my Facebook page if you came in late or you want to watch it again, okay? So um, in the first 72 hours of queen smoking, absolutely, you can have a physical craving. After 72 hours, it's your unconscious mind that's getting triggered and it's used to smoke, feel good, and it's used to going 200 times a day, smoke, feel good, smoke, feel good, smoke, feel good, okay? So you have to deal with that part of your brain. And just before I give you this, killer way to deal with any craving something practical that you can actually do to knock a craving out okay just before i do that just really want to make sure that you understand this uh, you only have one mind okay you don't have different parts of your mind you have one mind so when it comes to quitting smoking the problem with things like nicotine replacement therapies is it only deals with the physical addiction okay it weans you off the nicotine over time what it doesn't do is it doesn't deal with the habit. That's why it's so hard to quit smoking. That's why the efficacy rate of things like the patch in the gum is so low, right? So if you do that or people do that, use the patch in the gum, that's great. Anything that gets you to quit smoking is awesome. Do it. Do more than one thing. You can do the patch and you can do another method at the same time, okay? There's nothing wrong with doing it. It's just important to understand. So what we do in the hypnotherapy world is we deal with the unconscious part, right? We get you through the 72 hours and then we deal with the unconscious part of your mind that's created the habit so that when you get a trigger, okay, you're not fighting the beast, this massive supercomputer of your unconscious mind so that it's aligned with you, okay? So let me give you a really great uh, trick here that you can do to beat any craving, Okay, anytime. It could be any craving. It could be food. It could be ice cream. Okay, so uh, cravings past 72 hours are really just a, a pull to a habit in your unconscious mind. Okay, so here's how it works. And, and this comes from special forces training from the military. Okay, 
So the way, what happens is when we get a craving, okay? So if you remember, a craving is uh, a powerful desire for something, okay? So when we get a craving, what happens is we become tunnel visioned on the craving. So a smoker understands this because it's like, I'm, I, something's triggering me. I'm stressed out. I got to have a smoke. I got to have a smoke. I got to have a smoke. And we become tunnel vision. I got to have a cigarette. We're jonesing. I got to have that cigarette. Ah, I got to have a cigarette. Okay. This is the same thing that happens to anyone in any stressful situation. So here's how the military deals with it. And then we adjust it for smoking. And I'll show you how to do that. So the way that happens in the military is, particularly in special forces, they, they're the first ones to come under fire. That's a stressful situation. Somebody's trying to shoot you. They're trying to kill you, okay? So what they train them to do is take cover. Then the first thing they tell them to do is, once they've taken cover, is to take control of their physiology. So what does that mean? What happens is when someone's shooting at us or we have a craving or addiction, we become tunnel vision. Ah, I'm Jones, I gotta have a cigarette and we can't stop thinking about it. We become tunnel visioned. So imagine you're being shot at and you're focusing all your attention on where you're being shot at from. Well, guess what the number one military strategy is to get an opponent? Outflank them. Come up the side. They're often shooting at you to draw your attention. They want you tunnel vision. Okay? So what they're trying to train you in, in the military is how do you get yourself out of tunnel vision? It's the same thing with a craving. How you get yourself out of the craving or the tunnel vision. Okay? So here you are. Uh, I'm Jones and I got to have it. The first thing you do is take control of your physiology. What's the easiest way to take control of your body? breathing. So take two breaths, two deep breaths. Okay. Cause what happens is when we get tunnel visioned, we usually start to sh cut our breath short. It's almost like hyperventilating. I'm Josie. I got to have it right. We get anxious and we get anxiety. We start to, what happens? We, we lose control of our body. The craving has control. We don't, you got to get control of your body back. Take two deep breaths. That's the first thing you do. Take two deep breaths. Okay. That's it. Here's the second thing you do. There's three things you're going to do to beat any craving. Okay. The second thing you do is you have to broaden your perspective. Okay. If you broaden your perspective, okay, it takes away the tunnel vision. Here's how we're not going to do it the way they do it in, mil in the military, but the way they do it in the military is I'll just so you know, they stare forward and they notice something in their peripheral vision. Okay, but here's what you're going to do, because uh, you can't do this if you're in the military under fire. You're going to take your hands, you're going to put them way out. Okay, you can't see my hands, but essentially you're going to put them way out, and then you're going to bring it into your, bring your hands into your peripheral vision. Okay, and stare forward, but notice your hands, wiggle your fingers, just notice them. Okay, when you're tunnel visioned and you're having a craving and you're focused, ah, I'm Jones and I got to have a cigarette, I got to have a cigarette. Okay, you take control of your breathing. You broaden your perspective. Notice your fingers. When you do that, when you notice your peripheral vision, you can't be in tunnel vision. It is physically impossible for your brain to do both at the same time. Okay? So you take two deep breaths. You take control of your physiology. You broaden your perspective by putting your hands out, okay, and then into your peripheral vision. Wiggle your fingers and notice them. Just notice. That will pull you out of that tunnel vision. Okay? It's the second thing you do. One is you take two deep breaths. Two is you notice your peripheral vision. Okay? So <clears throat> the third thing is, and this is super important, you take an immediate course of action that gets you something you want in your life. So what they teach them in the military is to take two deep breaths, notice their peripheral vision to see if they're getting flanked, and then they tell them, go directly to your training. What you were trained to do, that's what you do. So what we do in smoking <clears throat> is we do something that gets us something we want in our life. Something simple and actionable. Get up and change your situation. Go get a drink of water. Go hug your partner. Go pet a dog. Go for a walk. Okay? <clears throat> Go get a glass of milk. Whatever it is. Take an immediate course of action that gets you something you want in your life. Okay? So here's how you beat any craving. The three things that you can practically do anytime you get a craving. Okay? Take control of your physiology. Take two deep breaths. Okay? 
broaden your perspective. Notice your peripheral vision for a minute. And then whatever you're doing, get up and take an immediate course of action that gets you something you want in your life. Okay? You can be, you can, it will evaporate cravings like that. Okay? Because that's not where the craving exists. The craving exists and we become tunnel vision. We become focused. We, be, we get anxiety about it. Our heart races up. We cut our breath short. Take control of your physiology first. Two deep breaths. Two. Okay? Broaden your perspective so you, you, you're not stuck in the tunnel vision. You can't be in tunnel vision if you're noticing your, your peripheral vision. Three. Get up. Whatever you're doing, leave it. And go and get something in your life that you want. That will make any craving evaporate and go away. Okay? So, uh, what did we learn today? So, here's what I'm, I'm trying to get across today. One, the first thing I'm trying to get across is that, you, that after 72 hours, you're not addicted anymore. You have a super powerful habit you gave yourself. 200 times a day, smoke, feel good, smoke, feel good, smoke, feel good. 400 times a day, depending on how many cigarettes you smoke, with an underdeveloped critical faculty, okay? You hypnotize yourself into smoking, okay? So after 72 hours, anything that remains is not an addiction. It's something else, and it is super powerful. It's, I mean, just look at the Facebook groups, all the comments people make about trying to quit smoking. You can see how hard it is, okay? So why most smokers fail like eight times, because they're fighting a supercomputer in their unconscious mind. And so people that you'll see them posting, ah, it's, I'm on day 150 and I'm still having cravings. It's because they haven't, they've only dealt with the physiological craving. They haven't dealt with the unconscious part of the mind. Okay. And it takes a long time to develop a new habit. So after a couple of years, people will go, okay, well, I'm craving free, but it took me a couple of years. It was really hard. Well, of course it takes, you just spent a decade or two decades giving yourself a habit. Of course, it's going to take a long time right? What hypnosis does is allows you to basically jump that process, jump to the front of the line, okay? So that little trick I gave you about how to deal with the craving will absolutely work and help, okay? Uh, you can at any time. There is tons of information. I try to create content so that somebody, if they want to, could watch all my content and quit smoking and not have to come see me. There's tons of content on my website. Uh, there's a free ebook on my website. You can download it. It's uh, how to prepare your mind for quitting smoking. It's a great first step in getting your mind around uh, what's it going to take to quit smoking. Okay. Uh, you can, you can message direct message me. I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. Okay. Um, please reach out. Go through my content. Go through my YouTube page. There's tons of stuff that will help anybody quit smoking. And uh, that's it. And I look forward to, uh, I'm going to be posting an, another one later this week about uh, another one about how to quit smoking and some other few tricks and tips if you're interested. And I'll post everything on my Facebook page so you can watch it later as well. Thank you for coming. I'm uh, Ted Bradley, Master Hypnotist.